Rural Heritage on RFD TV is brought to you by Rural Heritage Magazine, a bi monthly magazine featuring articles about farming and logging with draft animal power, small scale diversified family farming and homesteading, and other aspects of our rich rural heritage. Rural Heritage Magazine, borrowing from yesterday to do the work of today. For subscription information, please call 319 362 3027 or order online at www.ruralheritage.com. Hi, I'm Joe Mishka welcoming you to another episode of Rural Heritage TV. If you saw our episode a few months ago about the Lake Itasca Sawmill, you know how impressive these machines are that make up the sawmill. We showed you the wood-fired boiler, steam engine, log roller, and bandsaw, and learned a little bit about how it was all put together by volunteers belonging to the nonprofit organization called Lake Itasca Region Pioneer Farmers. Today, we're going to learn a little more of the history of the sawmill machinery and how it was all brought together to Lake Itasca. We'll also visit the saw sharpening room where the band saws are maintained. Don't go away. Julius and Niels came from Germany as a kid. They settled in Wisconsin, and he attended a college there. He was a, a parochial school teacher for six, seven years. And then he went to, they started a store, his family, and they were buying, trading lumber for groceries and things. And so he kind of got a little taste of the lumber business. And uh, then they had him and his brother bought a small sawmill. And then from there, uh, that had a fire, I believe. And then uh, he started, uh, J, J. Neal started a mill in Sock Rabbits, Minnesota. And he run there for a few years and he was running out of logs. And the logs were coming down the river on the, and into uh, Sock Rabbits. So then he had purchased land up in Cass Lake, Minnesota. And uh, he uh, bought a, a piece of ground that was a bog, more or less, but on Cass Lake. So he acquired some stumpage and, uh, and he uh, set his mill up. And it was a, it, the mill was the equipment that we have here now, at least the, the part of it. And uh, so then he uh, operated there in Cass Lake for, uh, well, by 1907, he could see that the timber was going to get short supply. So then he bought a mill out in Libby, Montana, and along with some land so that he would have more timber available to saw. So then he operated the mill in Cass Lake, though, until 1922. At such time, he sold the mill to the uh, Red Lake Indians at Red Bee, Minnesota, BIA purchased it. And so the mill was moved to Red Bee, and it was run there until, uh, well, they started in 1926. Then about 1932, timber supply was getting short there, as well as the economy wasn't good. So they were, they didn't, didn't have the sales they needed to keep it going right then. So they shut down. And they also got permission from the federal government to buy logs from outside loggers rather than just on the reservation. So that gave them a, a surge, and they started up in 1936 again. And in 36, supposedly, it was the largest mill running in Minnesota at that time. And that hasn't been totally verified, but that seems to be what the records say. So then, then the mill operated there until 19... Uh, uh, Oh, in the uh, late 50s, 
And then the mill was sold to Elf Eldon at Oslo, Minnesota, a farmer out there who had his own little steam show. So he uh, uh, moved the equipment that he purchased. There was an auction, so he didn't get all of the equipment. He got a good chunk of it. The main part we see here with the boiler, the in, not the boiler, the engine, and the line shaft, and band saw, and, and uh, shotgun feed. Shotgun feed is a steam cylinder, which moves the carriage back and forth. And that was acquired along with uh, some other equipment. And then uh, after it got moved to Eldon's farm, he did set the steam engine up under a cover, but he never operated it there. And uh, the rest of it laid in the woods. We have pictures of it laying out there in the woods and how we got it, what it was like when the club uh, Lake Itasca Region Pioneer Farmers bought it from his estate. And so then that was about, uh, I forget, 97 or somewhere in there. And uh, so then uh, the club members, some of them went over to move the equipment and we have pictures of how everything was laying out in the weeds and the brush. And we had a map that someone made showing a large junk pile here uh, and something else over here. And they moved it, that equipment. They did a real good job getting all the pieces. And so they moved it over here to our showgrounds at Lake Itasca. And uh, there it laid in the weeds again for a number of years. But then, uh, well, first off, though, the steam engine was the first thing they got started as far as the base. And that's the base here for the steam engine. And that base is eight foot deep. And this was on a, this, the, the base stuck up out of, like a monument off of the ground. And Kerry Winkleman and Tim, they hauled dirt in for all one summer building it up and then uh, the mill sat there uh, doing nothing and uh, then uh, about 2001 or somewhere in there why a couple of people got busy to set the steam engine put it somewhat together and due to the fact the, mill, the engine was being put together. A uh, number of us thought it was time to start on the rest of the equipment. So we uh, started on the carriage in 2004 and uh, rebuilt the carriage. You'll see up there, they'll fill them. And uh, it was, uh, it was, uh, totally stripped down, all rusted, the wood was rotted out, and so we had to put in all new wood, we had to free up the knees and all the rest of it, and uh, then we uh, were looking for a boiler to run the steam engine, and then uh, what I call the Lake Itasca Region Pioneer Farmers miracle happened. Uh, we, uh, my brother Leonard was uh, on the internet and he was visiting with a guy in Washington, Linden, Washington area, who uh, had 2,500 axes for sale. And he called me and said, I might be interested in those axes. So I called the guy and we talked axes and we got done. He said, is there anything else you're looking for? I said, well, we're looking for a wood fire boiler. He said, we got one for sale. So uh, the club then, at least part of the guys wanted to sell. So anyway, my wife was going out there in two weeks to get some other stuff out in Washington. And uh, anyway, looked at the boiler and the club bought the boiler and uh, got it moved to our grounds here. And then the boiler sat there for a couple of years. And then we finally got that prepared. And uh, at the same time, 
uh, we started laying foundation plans for the uh, mill and because uh, now you see all we had was a steam engine sitting in. So the belt that we run on here is a 105 foot long endless leather cowhide belt 28 inches wide and probably the original I'm not positive but it could be and so then I and a few other fellas we got busy and uh, well we we did lay out a model of how it was going to look the understructure and uh, then we started putting that together and then we uh, we needed some money to do this with and uh, we went to the Historical Society of Minnesota. We got some money, part of the money that would buy the concrete. We got that put together and then uh, we uh, uh, got the uh, cement work done. And then we started moving in the equipment but we had to refurbish everything. Uh, like the knees on the carriage and so forth was all rusted, wouldn't move. We made a tank and, uh, and put WD-40 in the tank and soaked them. And there's any number of things we did like this to get going. And uh, so we uh, went from the carriage rebuilding. That was kind of interesting too. We, we got the carriage rebuilt after three years and uh, there was a couple of uh, people from Red Lake who actually operated the carriage and they came down and of course they're already uh, it was 50 uh, yeah 50 or a little better years that they've been on that carriage so they were really surprised that they could stand right where they worked when they were the mill was up at Red Lake and so we uh, got the carriage done, got the frame up, and then we, with the, we wanted some more money. Well, also by that time, the, the engineering people, steam engineering people, they had gotten the engine prepared and everything. So we, and some of the other finer work, the uh, belt tighteners and all, oh, there was all stuff that they, that they were doing. We were fortunate to have people capable of different areas. And especially we were happy to see the machinists, like from KNL, who are members, Carrie and Tim and, and Caitlin and so because anyway. you can't go to a parts store to buy parts. Uh, no, but we, uh, we did have a catalog. Okay. So you know what they're supposed to be. Well, we had a catalog for the clutch pulley. <laughs> okay. Because this was all made by Diamond. And one of our fellows put me onto a catalog out on the internet. And it showed our clutch pulley and parts and the pricing. And of course, they were pretty reasonable pricing. <laughs> Not only is the mill historic because it has spent its entire life in Minnesota, but it was right. built and manufactured in the state as well that's by incredible. Diamond that's, Ironworks. That's just a treasure. Yeah. That's amazing. Anyway, then we got into some equipment that was separate from what we bought. And Brian will be happy to tell you about the log turn and the work we did. Sure. And uh, uh, then we, uh, and we're still, we're not done. Right. We, we have a, we are working on our edger the edger we didn't get with the mill, and uh, we had one here we were going to use, but the edger that came out of this mill was over at Rolock, Minnesota at the show. The Western Minnesota Steam Threshers yep, Reunion. Yep, yeah, I've done that. Yep. And uh, Jim Bryden over there was an advocate in getting the, that edger traded for another one. And, uh, but we haven't got that hooked up yet because of the difficulty and switching our power from the line shaft here running east and west and the arbor going north and south. Okay. And Brian, he, uh, him and his 
crew, why they've been working hard on getting that ready. So, so before, when the, when the mill and Cat and Redby um, shut down in, I think Earl said about 1958, it's about the time that uh, Danny Rowan of Comstock, Minnesota, had a fire in his first sawmill, okay. and it, it wrecked it. Okay. And he was able to purchase the edger from the Red Bee Mill and then move it to his new sawmill. That sawmill then got moved to Rolog at Western Minnesota Seam Thrashers Reunion, got renamed the Bride and Rowan Sawmill. I, I believe they moved it there in the early 90s, and it had been signed since about 96, 97. And so that's where the, the edger was. They got it before uh, the Eldons were able to purchase the rest of the mill components. And so a lot of our members here um, are members down at Rolog as sure, well. Of course. Myself, I worked in the mill, and I was able to talk Jim Bryden out of that edger. Um, and he thought it would be a good place for it to be because it's basically home here. And so my brother-in-law and I drove all the way out into... Um, um, Eureka, California, and picked up a replacement edger. To trade. To trade, brought wow. it back to the shop on the farm, <laughs> fixed it up, and then we made the trade. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's been, been a lot of years, been, been fun. We did a lot of chasing around, fun getting stuff available, a lot of work, and uh, we have now, what I've been told, and what we can't find out, we're the only mill, whether it's uh, a commercial mill or a show mill, we're the only one with a stationary driven bandsaw. In fact, the bandsaw itself is unique. We have the shotgun feed. We have the uh, steam log turner. And uh, then another little item that what a steam enthusiast told me the other day that if you want to see a Corliss running under the governor, there's only two mills doing that now, or machines doing that. This one and another one, and under load, running at the mill, we're the only one running under load. Wow. So anyway, and he uh, is a guy that that uh, goes to shows in Australia and different places. Yeah, yeah flatbeds carried it. Um, got the enough tires under them? The yeah. flywheel comes in two pieces. Wow. Yep. Wow. It was hauled in two pieces and then uh, trained together. Yeah. And obviously before the building was built. Right. Um, built that, the building around it. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yep. And so I, uh, my understanding is the, uh, the, uh, the, the flywheel, the belt wheel, is about 10 ton. And then the um, crank disc and shaft is another 10 ton. How much does the belt weigh? That leather belt. Uh, it's got to well, be a couple hundred pounds. Yeah, it depends on uh, who's lifting it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't think uh, it'd be more than two men could, could lift. Right. Yeah. Yeah, the band comes in here and gets pinched between these two rollers here yep. and we can move those rollers back and forth and we put apply pressure here and by doing that we're expanding the metal and and um, expanding putting the metal by squeezing it. by squeezing it and and then that puts tension into the saw blade and so it's very important that we're doing that cold yes absolutely yeah. so it's really important that we maintain um, uh, proper tension in our saw blades otherwise they won't run very well and right. it's a it's an art and a skill that uh, many take a lifetime to master and get really good at. And so it's, it's kind of um, presumptuous to think that some weekend warriors like ourselves here are ever going to get to the skill level that they were able to. But we have some help that uh, they're helping us teach and it's, it's hoped that we can at least take care of some of the basics. And if we get into some difficult spots, we can bring in experts or um, we can send the blades out to get worked on. The nearest place that we know that we will handle these wide band mills is north of Green Bay. Okay. Um, and it's, so it's, it's quite a haul yeah. uh, to get them up here. Now, we bought these two bands, the one that's on the saw and the one here about 10 years ago from Simmons. And they cost about a little less than $1,500 a piece back then. And so I'm sure you're looking at 
$2,500 now yeah. for new bands. And we really probably should be purchasing a couple more now um, because we're getting more use out of the saw. And it's, you know, essentially we just have one that runs and one that's getting worked on. It'd be nice to have some more in, right. in spare. Lumps and humps we, get, we take care of uh, on, our, on our hammering anvils. So this is, this is what we use for a flat surface to check if the band is flat. Right. This is where we'll actually do the hammering, and we have several hammers. Um, each hammer kind of does a little bit of a different thing. These are not your typical hammers, you know, they're very smooth. Right, um, they sure are. And you, we'll take out lumps and humps out of the saw blades to make sure that, that they're flat. And so it's obviously easy to do that up here. You know, the bumps will be up, and you'll hammer them down. Well, what if they're going the other way? So we use that one down there. <laughs> and so we have a pit down here and we'll uh, hop down there and then you can hammer on the, the bottom side of, the inside of the band essentially to take, take the. So this is our saw filer. Like I said, it's an Armstrong number five. And um, Yeah, it's it's a little sticky. We haven't run it this year. Yeah. So this is going to automatically index our saw blade, and um, when we sharpen, what we'll do is um, we'll come down with our. Um, adjustments on here that I can make. I can I can make fine adjustments and move the saw blade towards one side of the tooth or the other simply by turning on this wheel. We can also adjust the the depth of cut. Now this this um there's cams under here and the cams one cam is turning on a shaft they're both turning on the same shaft. One cam rotates and pushes the saw blade forward, and the other cam is what lifts and lowers the the sharpener. And so um, we called up Simmons, who owns Armstrong Sharpeners now, and they were able to send us a two cam combo to match the gullet profile for the saw blades that we purchased. So and that's synchronized. Yes, that, that and they so were kind enough to actually send them out for free for us. If you look in there, you can see the two. Yeah. The two, uh, the two cams in there. This program is available for purchase. To order your copy, please call 319-362-3027 or visit www.ruralheritage.com. Rural Heritage is a bi-monthly magazine dedicated to draft animal farming and logging as well as other aspects of our rich rural heritage. It is published by Mishka Press, which also offers a complete line of back-to-the-land books, DVDs, and calendars. Call or write for a catalog or subscription information. Or visit our website at www.ruralheritage.com.